Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Rair Eterian. I'm a neurologist and uh, I specialize in sleep medicine. And I'm on faculty here at Northwestern University. Um, I would like to um, make this session uh, interactive, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions. I've prepared very few slides, relatively few, so that we can have a more uh, uh, informal kind of conversation, okay? So what do we know about sleep in scleroderma and systemic sclerosis? The truth is that not much. Um, the, the most comprehensive medical database, I did a search, and from 1965 till today, there's actually only eight papers published. Um, and this is the summary. So in 2002, um, and by the way, uh, two of the earliest papers published in the 60s and 70s um, were in Polish with no English uh, translation, so I, I, I can't <laughs> tell you what they say. But the uh, first one I could read was in 2002, and they took 27 people with scleroderma and they did sleep studies on them, a polysomnography, which is a... Um, uh, type of testing that requires the person to spend the night in the sleep lab and they're hooked up to uh, a, few a few electrodes or sensors on their head for brain waves, a few on their face for muscle twitching and eye movements, and some on their uh, body to monitor breathing and limb movements. Um, so when they looked at the uh, uh, quality of sleep, which is measured by amount of time spent awake after initially falling asleep, uh, all 27 people had poor sleep quality based on that one measure. Um, but the main correlates of poor sleep quality um, were uh, difficulty with uh, swallowing or issues with esophageal motility, so those who had uh, more problems with it had poorer quality sleep, difficulty breathing, and there was a higher prevalence of a condition called restless leg syndrome, which is a, um, a neurologic condition where whenever the person is at rest or laying down, they feel this uh, uh, irresistible urge to move their legs. And when they move their legs, there's temporary relief. The moment they quiet down, it comes back again. And because it happens mostly in the evening and at night, it can affect sleep. So in 2011, um, they wanted to see if pain, per se, had any correlation with uh, poor sleep. So they took uh, um, 70 patients, and um, the two correlates uh, the most important disruptor of uh, uh, sleep was pain. So the higher they scored on the pain scale, the poorer their sleep quality was. And the other second determined was marital status. Not <laughs> <laughs> which, means <laughs> which means that single people had poorer sleep than married people, not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> um, another group the same year uh, had uh, 180 uh, people with scleroderma and they had a large database of people with chronic illnesses, um, a variety of chronic illnesses. So they did a uh, retrospective uh, review of the data and looked at people with uh, scleroderma versus people with uh, chronic illness. And these were the results. So, um, and they compared it to the general U.S. population. So, in, I don't know if I have a, a po pointer here. Oh, yeah. So, in, in blue, it's the scleroderma patients. In red, it's the general U.S. population. And in uh, um, yellow or off-white, uh, it's the uh, chronic, other people with chronic illnesses. So the average sleep per night 
in their database was about the same in all three groups. So the number of hours actually slept. Sleep disturbances were significantly higher in uh, the scleroderma group, even when compared to other people with chronic illness. Same with awakening with short, shortness of breath, um, and daytime sleepiness, and sleep quality. Uh, while snoring uh, um, uh, um, was not much different, suggesting perhaps that uh, uh, the awakening of short breath is not necessarily due to sleep apnea, which presents with snoring as well. And if you look, if people said whether their sleep was adequate or not, people with scleroderma scored the lowest, meaning they felt that their sleep wasn't adequate. And this is, you know, and the, chronic, the, uh, the database with chronic illnesses included other autoimmune and rheumatologic and inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, uh, and other like diabetes and so forth. So how about um, other factors? So in addition to gastrointestinal disturbances, shortness of breath, and pain, depression and itching are also uh, major determinants of poor sleep in scleroderma. Uh, and as in many chronic illnesses, when you have poor sleep, automatically you have poor quality of life. So when you measure poor sleep measures against quality of life measures, they almost always go hand in hand. So um, what do we know in general about sleep in chronic illness? Majority of what we know comes from um, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and uh, chronic heart disease. Um, and we generally, when, whenever we're talking about any kind of uh, um, uh, rheumatologic condition, we use uh, rheumatoid arthritis as the benchmark because we have the most data in, the, in that population. Sleep apnea plays a big role in uh, 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 disturbing sleep in chronic condition, and uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, they are, uh, sleep apnea is significantly more common, uh, even if you account for weight. So, they don't have to be overweight and obese to have uh, sleep apnea. Um, and when you treat the sleep apnea, then that significantly improves sleep complaint. Pain is a huge uh, issue with sleep because uh, what happens is that uh, obviously if you're in pain, your sleep is going to be poorer quality. Different times of night, you know, when uh, your pain uh, sensation increases, it's going to disrupt your sleep, but also when you have poorer sleep, your threshold for pain is much lower during the day. So poor sleep makes pain worse, and poor sleep makes inflammation worse, and inflammation and pain make poor sleep poorer. In addition, um, it's a, it's a uh, problem because we do not have um, good pain medications out there that can be used on chronic basis and that do not cause dependence. And the medications that have the best control of pain are usually uh, uh, in the opiate class, and not only they are highly addictive, they can also make sleep itself poorer in quality by depressing breathing um, and uh, um, overall making sleep more fragmented. So depression. Depression seems to be a, a taboo subject. No one you know, wants to talk about it, uh, especially in um, you know, busy clinics. But Depression almost always goes hand in hand with chronic illness. Um, and it has a similar negative relationship with like sleep and pain. So if you're depressed, your sleep is going to be poorer quality. And if your sleep is poorer quality, chronically, your depression is going to get worse. Uh, acutely, when you sleep poorly one night, 
there may be a sense of elation, so depression gets a little better, but then chronically it will make the depression worse, which in turn will make the sleep quality worse. So depression is easily treated, but again, the treatment has its own problems with uh, sleep. So if, if you rely on the commonly available affordable treatment like antidepressants and etc., you have to be careful uh, uh, because they themselves can cause poor sleep quality. So you have to balance, you know, uh, very, play a very careful balancing game. Uh, there are uh, um, cognitive behavioral treatments that a psychologist does that are quite effective and can shorten the duration the person has to be on antidepressants or at least lower the dose of the effective antidepressants. But they're not readily available and they tend to be expensive. Um, it's in my experience referring people to, uh, to people, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, about half of the best people out there who do it don't take medical insurance. So you have to go pay them out of pocket and it can be expensive and then hope your insurance company will reimburse you. And the other half who do take medical insurance have limitations, like they don't take public aid or they don't take, you know, this company or that company and so forth. So that can be, uh, the availability is, a, is an issue. So what other common sleep disorders occur in chronic illness? As we saw in scleroderma, and this is true also for diabetes, it's restless leg syndrome. What is restless leg syndrome? And how do we make the diagnosis? So if you, any of you, have had a sleep study and the person uh, you saw told you that your sleep study showed you had restless leg syndrome, that is not a correct diagnosis because a sleep study does not show restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is a condition that's diagnosed in the clinic, okay, not by uh, you know, looking at a sleep study. A sleep study may suggest that, oh, you know, why don't you screen this person for restless legs, but it's not something, you, and you should, no one should do a sleep study on you to rule out restless leg syndrome, because the ruling out and ruling in is done in the clinic by history. So the key features you need to have, you have to have an urge to move the legs, usually, but not always, accompanied by uncomfortable sensation. So there are a few people who have this incredible urge to move the legs, but they don't have any sensation associated with it. It's just this irresistible urge. But most people have an uncomfortable, indescribable sensation. It's not really pain, but it's really uncomfortable. It's not really itching. And so uh, temporary relief uh, with movement. So if the relief happens when you change positions in bed, then that's not restless leg syndrome. Because the relief has to accompany movement. So movement has to give you the relief. And when you stop moving, the sensation uh, comes back. And movement um, uh, is not necessarily mean actually getting up and moving. It could also mean massages. Um, and uh, uh, another movement equivalent is putting your legs or feet in, in warm water. If that, those two things relieve it and then you stop doing it and it comes back, then that's a pretty good indication that you met this criteria. The third you must have is that the symptoms are worse during rest or inactivity and they get worse the more inactive you are. So people with restless leg syndrome who are not treated, uh, long plane rides, like overseas plane rides, are hell for them because they're stuck eight hours in the same seat and it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, if your pain is, or your discomfort is worse by walking, then that's not restless leg. It usually is worse by sitting or... And then the fourth criterion you must have is that this must get worse in the evening or at night. Some people have it during the day, but it's usually worse in the evening and at night, okay? 
So for somebody to have restless leg syndrome, you have to have all four of these criteria. Okay. If one is missing, then the diagnosis cannot be made. Uh, in addition, other things that accompany this is sleep disturbances, because most people um, who don't work night shifts, so they sleep at night. So when this happens at night, it disrupts their sleep. Um, some people also describe these uh, when they're trying to relax in the evening or at night, these involuntary muscle jerks. You certainly don't have to have them for the diagnosis, but that can be one thing. And a positive family history, um, especially in um, female family members. Another thing that happens, especially when women come after menopause with restless legs, if uh, you question further, they always have had, had some experience of this with, if they've been pregnant with one or other of their pregnancies. Uh, because it's quite common in, in pregnancy. And having it in pregnancy increases the risk later on in life. So the difficulty sleeping at night and the uh, uh, daytime sleepiness are not purely uh, that, oh, you didn't sleep much, therefore, you're sleepy during the day. Or uh, um, your sleep was disrupted, therefore you have difficulty falling asleep. There's also a hormonal substrate. Because as we saw in that other study, uh, people with scleroderma did not overall, the number of hours they slept wasn't different than the general population or other people with chronic illness. So what's disrupting the sleep and what's causing the daytime sleepiness? Some of the things that do are these uh, inflammatory hormones. And this is also true for uh, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. For example, when you compare uh, people with rheumatoid arthritis to people with osteoarthritis, people with osteoarthritis, you control their pain, you know, they have an injection in their knee, the pain is gone, their sleep improves. So there's no inflammatory process. Here, with other kin conditions, so there are all these inflammatory hormones that are uh, secreted, and um, um, I'll leave this slide up because uh, at 1.15 there's going to be a quiz on. <laughs> <laughs> so basically all these are sleep inducing, and at the same time you have other hormones, inflammatory hormones and chemicals being secreted in the body chronically that are sleep disrupting. So both conditions are uh, at play here. So what's the solution? The solution is a comprehensive approach to patients, okay? Medicine has become so uh, advanced in the last uh, um, uh, couple of decades that no single physician can know everything about, even about one condition and its associated problems. So comprehensive approach is very important. So the, the, uh, the days of, you know, the uh, family doctor with a bag coming to the house and fixing everything, they're over. You can't, especially when you have a conditions that affect multiple organ systems. So you need to have a comprehensive approach when treating people with chronic illnesses. Multidisciplinary clinics are uh, starting to uh, uh, develop, and they're the best way to do it. But obviously, you can't expect every medical center or every clinic to have that. Um, we have a multidisciplinary clinic here, for example, for eczema. So once a month, uh, we have a clinic where uh, myself as a sleep uh, specialist and a neurologist, uh, a dermatologist who specializes in eczema, an allergist, and a psychiatrist, we see the same patients in a row. So the patient spends the two, three hours in the clinic, and they get everything addressed, and we meet, we discuss. But you can do it with uh, you know, uh, talking to other physicians and et cetera. It's important to reduce, especially when we're talking about sleep problems, reducing polypharmacy or multiple meds 
is very, very important. I'm not saying that if you need medication for something, don't take it, but we try to kill two birds with one stone by giving one medicine maybe that does two things rather than piling on medicine after medicine. So it's very important when dealing with sleep problems. So, for example, uh, uh, there are medications that can treat both depression and reduce chronic pain. So we choose that over a medication that only will treat depression or only will treat pain. There are medications that can target both restless leg syndrome and pain rather than giving two separate ones. And there are those that will improve sleep and pain. Again, none of them are like 100% here, take this and you're much better because you know, these are all chronic symptoms of a, a, a multifactorial illness. But it's better than having many more meds because the more meds you add on board, the more the side effects. And then the side effects themselves may need treatment so it becomes a, a vicious circle. Also, um, even if, let's say, um, and this treating the conditions simultaneously is a relatively new concept. Surprising that it's relatively new, but it's relatively new. Let's say, um, uh, for example, somebody comes to me with sleep apnea, and I know that the sleep apnea caused their blood pressure. I no longer just treat their sleep apnea. I have their primary care doctor treat the blood pressure as well. If the sleep apnea treatment improved the blood pressure afterwards, you can always stop the blood pressure medication. Same way, if somebody has a chronic illness, like they, let's say they have scleroderma or rheumatoid arthritis, and because of that they feel depressed, you don't just treat the underlying problem and hope the mood improves. You treat both together, and if the underlying problem treatment improves the mood, then you always stop the antidepressant, because treating things simultaneously always helps improve both conditions much faster and much more effectively. Okay, so um, in conclusion, um, sleep is a very fragile state and it's significantly disturbed in all sorts of chronic illnesses. Um, treating the sleep disturbance will improve quality of life, and sometimes or often you have to treat the sleep disturbance together with treating the underlying problem, because especially with sleep, and we're finding this uh, uh, especially with, in our eczema clinic, that even after the itch is controlled, sleep has been fragmented so much that it has, the fragmented sleep has taken a life of its own. So treat sleep as well as treating the underlying problem. And it's important to keep in mind that, um, yes, improving the medical problem can lead to improved or does lead to some improvement in quality of life, but almost always poor sleep equals poor quality of life. So, Improving sleep is essential to improve quality of life. And um, sleep, depression, and pain are very interdependent. All three of them feed off each other. So um, one causes the other to worsen, and that worsening causes the first one to get worse. So it's important to have a comprehensive approach of treating all these conditions, all these symptoms.